welcome, welcome back to Unapologetically Black Unicorns. And as usual, I have a fantastic, phenomenal, and yes, I always use the word exciting, so I'll use it again, exciting guest who I um, am just getting to know, but the work I'm familiar with. And so excited to welcome Dr. Sherry Turner. And why don't you introduce yourself, Dr. Turner? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Karis. I'm honored to be joining the cohort of Unapologetically Black Unicorns. Uh, It's great to be here. Please do call me Shairi, but I am Dr. Shairi Turner. I'm a mother, a wife, a physician, a mental health advocate, a trauma specialist, and she, her are my pronouns. And I'm the chief health officer at Crisis Text Line. And, um, you know, amidst this global suicide and mental health epidemic, Crisis Text Line is a nonprofit organization that provides free 24 7 high quality text based mental health support and crisis intervention in English and Spanish. So that's a lot. Yes. I always love when people start with, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a, like, you have this whole thing going on before it's your profession, right? right like right. like the family thing, so important. Yes, so thanks yes. for sharing that. So when you got into this work, I'm always curious, how do people determine what profession they're going to, like, I wouldn't list, go down a list and go, hmm, trauma. Yes, that's me, check. Like, how does, right. how did that happen? Right, right. You know, and it, you only, it's interesting because as you get to a certain point in your career, you can look back and see the story that the the narrative that got you there. But as you're in the moment making those decisions, you don't always realize like where you're going to end up. Right. So I always say like life is a journey. It's about the journey, not the destination. Um, I think when I was a young person, I thought the destination was to become a doctor. I wanted to be a primary care physician. I wanted to be a pediatrician. I wanted to take care of children. Parallel or in in conjunction with that, and unbeknownst to me, I we had family friends who were uh, close and almost like cousins to me that were deeply embedded in a trauma cycle. Back then we weren't calling it trauma but I considered these people, my cousins, right? I considered them very close, but it was a family that later on I came to understand was, you know, there was addiction, there was physical abuse, there was sexual abuse, there was emotional abuse, there was spousal abuse, you know, and, and that existed in a family that we were close with, right. And didn't see Mm -hmm. it, didn't know about it directly, But as it happens, right, the only black male in the family was incarcerated. So he was my peer incarcerated Mm -hmm. for 20 years, in fact. And I visited him in prison and saw how they were filled. You know, prison was filled with black men, oftentimes young, older black men, younger black men, brown men, you know, Latino men with families, with children. Right. So it was very Mm -hmm. um, real and very personal. Um, And that is ultimately where my cousin took his life. And it was at that point that I became a suicide loss survivor before, again, I even knew what that term was. And I was 26 at that age. At that point, um, I was in residency. So in medical school, um, interestingly, and it's progressed a little bit since then, but we really don't learn, you know, we're as medical students, we're learning about the body, we're learning about the physiology. And if you're interested in psychiatry, then, you know, you go on and and do that for residency, but otherwise you get, you know, these short experiences and we don't talk much. We're not at that point, we're not teaching about mental health and the connection, the mind body connection, right? We were just addressing the neck down. But for me, uh, my last rotation in medical school, I worked with veterans in a dual diagnosis unit and it was mental health and substance abuse. And I absolutely loved it because Mm -hmm. it was an opportunity to see talk therapy to see group therapy really lift people from despair. But I was already on this, you know, type A track to primary care. I was going to be an internist and a pediatrician. I was going to Harvard and like, I was not going to waver from there in any way. 
but I believe the universe puts you where you're supposed to be. Ultimately, Mm -hmm. Um, I did go on and do a medicine pediatrics residency, planning to practice primary care, but got pulled towards public health. Mm -hmm. So I did a one year fellowship. And during that time, my cousin was deceased at that time, but I wanted to work with the Department of Youth Services. So the Department of Juvenile Justice in Massachusetts. And I just remember being there and having one of the the detention center administrators just say, you know, if you could treat hopelessness for these kids, you would solve so much of why they're here. And what he was speaking about really was the connection, the trauma, right? Mm -hmm. Without saying it, without even realizing it himself. And trauma wasn't in my vocabulary either. So fast forward a little bit, I finished that and then went on to the Harvard Injury Control Research Center and did a two-year fellowship where I focused on disproportionate minority contact. So again, tying back to my cousin's situation, just looking at and recognizing how, how, how disproportionate Black men, Black people, people of color were pulled into the justice system. What could I do about that? But I wanted to know more because I felt like at that point it was a public health issue because they were in prison, but they ultimately, most of them went home. And what was the public health effects on that? Mm -hmm. From there, I actually went and became the chief medical director for the Department of Juvenile Justice. And that's where my understanding of trauma really blossomed, because at that point, people were just starting to hear about the adverse childhood experiences study and the connection between all the abuses, neglect, family dysfunction, and mental health and physical health. And it was that aha moment because it made me look at these kids in the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice so differently, right? Mm -hmm. To say like, no child is born bad, right? They're born into these situations to imperfect parents who are part of the trauma cycle themselves and their behavior, you know, becomes a response to that. And then society responds to that behavior, especially amongst our black and brown children. And where do they wind up? They wind up in juvenile justice and then they ultimately wind up in corrections. So, you know, I could always go back to that story of my cousin Mm -hmm. and it just became clearer and clearer what was happening then and how it impacted what what came to be so important to me now. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, several years down the, the road, I joined Crisis Text Line because it it brought together everything. It brought together my background in public health, so a large-scale intervention to help people with trauma histories cope, give Mm -hmm. them coping strategies, give them access, large-scale. You know, my husband says I see trauma everywhere, right? And (laughs) at this point, I do because it's so pervasive. Yeah. Um, and it's such a the root cause of so many mental health issues in some form or fashion, right? Like I said, children are not born bad. Children are not born with ADHD, anxiety, depression. They're born into these complicated situation. You know, so when you mm. see school shootings, we have to think trauma, gang violence, trauma, health problems, obesity, trauma. Mm. So, um, it's a long story, but that's how I got here because it's our mental health and well being is everything. It's yeah. just everything. Exactly. So thank you for sharing that story, especially sort of that genesis. I'm always interested in the genesis story, and it usually is tied to a personal experience, a very personal experience, either related to um, you know supporting a family member and losing a family member or in you know a person's own recovery. So thank you for sharing that. And I like hearing stories too, because people start to put dots together and those putting those dots and making those connections, you know, I think really informs how they do their work, um, especially if they have that personal experience, which you talked about. So at Crisis Text Line, let's talk a little bit more about Crisis Text Line, like who's using the line and um, yeah, how is it helpful for them? Yes. So the way crisis text line works is that someone will 
text in on their phone and we have a, an algorithm depending on what word the person uses to text in or what they name as their crisis, we have associated those words with risk. So if someone texts in with a word that our triage recognizes as risk, we will move that person higher up in the queue. So to prioritize them, get them uh, help sooner, um, then say someone who texts in and said, my crisis is about homework, right? So we get to everyone. And we've done since 2013, we've actually done 7.6 million conversations. But we, we want to get to the people who are at the highest risk first. And once they text in, they're received by the crisis counselor, volunteer, who's had 30 hours of training and is supervised all on our platform. So this is all, you know, virtually the volunteer is supervised by a mental health professional who's our staff. And basically we risk assess everyone. So we want to make sure that we don't miss anyone who is at risk for suicide, who may not state it to begin with. So someone who texts in with, again, like, concerned about homework or studies or school, they, the volunteers trained how to kind of ease into the conversation questions about having thoughts about risk, about death or dying, right? So that every conversation, we make sure we touch upon that in case it's buried in the back and in the kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's that thought that's sitting there for someone that they don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing, right? Bringing forward on their own. So if there is that thought, that ideation, then um, the volunteer proceeds with asking about if there's a plan or is there, you know, what are the means, right? Is this someone who has access to a gun? Um, and then what's the time frame? And then we really focus in those instances on de-escalation, trying to bring the texture to a calmer, cooler place where they are not at as high of a risk of suicide. But in those actually only 1% of the conversations actually go on to an active rescue which is when we're not able to de-escalate the, the texture. And we believe that they are at high risk of hurting themselves, harming themselves, death, dying. So uh, the crisis supervisor reaches out to the local emergency services to access someone who can basically do a wellness check mm -hmm. and ensure that this person is safe. But because of our um, training and our model, we have successfully de-escalated so, far more conversations than have required, you know, any sort of intervention. 70% of our textures are 24 or younger. So we're really, as you can imagine, with a text, purely text modality, we are reaching millennials and Gen Z, these digital natives, right, who mm -hmm. aren't as interested in talking about what's going on by phone. They are much more adept at texting and interested in texting. So um, we found in 2021 that actually 44% of our texters were 17 or younger, and 13% were 13 or younger, 13 years old or younger. And then 46% of our texters are BIPOC and 53% of our texters identified as LGBTQ+. So we are, you know, when you look at access and uh, communities that are dealing with mental health disparities and issues of getting, you know, help to those communities, we're actually able to reach them um, at greater rates and with greater impact. And that's a focus for us. So understanding who we're reaching and wanting to even do better, do more right. and make, create partnerships to ensure that we're getting out to these communities more. Wow. That's really, um, I don't think I've seen those statistics before. Those are amazing statistics. And you said, um, so for the BIPOC community that's um, texting in, 
are you all finding any themes or, you know, any commonalities around issues that are coming up for particular communities, whether it be BIPOC or LGBTQ in particular? Yes. So our data um, and our insights are collected anonymously and voluntarily. So at the end of the conversation, the texter can volunteer to fill out a survey that is does not collect any of their personal information and they only really have to provide what they want to, but it does allow us to collect demographics and age. And then they also indicate what the topic of conversation was as, and the, the volunteer also completes a survey to help us identify what are the topics that are coming up. And we have a United in Empathy report that we put out each year to show what's going on in the country, but also breaking it out by demographics. So, for example, Black texters in 2021 were more likely to discuss depression and sadness, anxiety, stress, suicide, isolation, and loneliness more than the crisis text line national average, right? So of all of, we have about 21% of our texters fill out the survey, but we see these differences demographically and there's similarities, um, you know, similar elevations amongst other BIPOC communities. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to us as well to not just do black, white, other, black, white, Latino. So we are, you know, collecting indigenous people, right? Mm -hmm. We're collecting Native American, Alaska Natives, AAPI. We want to know what's happening with the Asian community. So our United in Empathy report allows us to see that our BIPOC community is struggling with these similar, you know, many of these similar issues more so than the average or the white um, textures, which reflects, you know, what we're seeing in suicide rates yes. amongst our youth. Yeah. It's just that silent epidemic that is just taking our children. Yeah. It's devastating. It's devastating. Wow. So this is really, I mean, you know, I know people have um, concerns, whether it's crisis text line, 988, meta, IG, Twitter, you know, everybody is concerned about their privacy online. Let's just, I mean, we have yes. to be right. Naturally. Right. Right. So I'm, and, and so you hear me kind of saying it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's ubiquitous that we're online. That's how we do our work. We do it on zoom. We do it on teams. We do it on whatever. And, um, you know, as I'm hearing you talk about the data, <laughs> first of all, I'm, you know, I heard you say that people voluntarily fill out a uh, survey at the end. So this is me saying you have access to this. And I think right. sometimes it's important for you know, our listeners, I, I like listeners to make up their minds about what they want to do from the information they're hearing. I'm not pushing one thing or the other. But um, one thing that I find interesting about data is how does it help especially right. when you're giving it voluntarily, that right. if we can give data voluntarily, can it help improve services? Can it help yes. improve responses? But again, it's that consent to give the data voluntarily, right. I think, right? Right. So, so for us, we are about privacy, trust, and accessibility. Those are really the key tenets for us because if our textures don't trust us, then we can't provide the service, mm -hmm. right? So we are, again, don't collect any personal data. We do not want insurance information. We don't want your name. We really want first and foremost to help you and to make sure that whatever information that is collected in the surveys is anonymous, right? Is not able to be connected to any individual because privacy is everything. And um, we really don't want uh, the textures to feel like they have to think about that while they're sharing these, mm -hmm. you know, these deep thoughts that they're having while they're in crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So we also know that in most instances, uh, 741, 741 does not even show up on a texter's phone bill. 
so that we can ensure that privacy and accessibility to everyone. The purpose of the insights that are gathered and kind of rolled up and aggregated is to help both us provide a better service, so continuous improvement, and for us as a nation to better understand real time the mental health concerns of people in different places, different ages, different genders. What is it that people are struggling with? And then that allows policymakers to focus, you know, there's more of a focus now on mental health. There's more funding on mental health than ever, but it's always better to target that funding to best serve a specific community. And how can you do that? You can't do that with data that's two years old, right? It's Uh not, you're not current enough, right? So what a community might want to address pre-COVID is going to be very different, vastly different than what they would address Uh post-COVID. So this allows the real-time information and the real-time dashboards and data insights, again, helping the greater good while preserving the privacy of the individual. Wow. And I I was just thinking, first of all, you said 741741. That's the first time we've ever said that. So I know what it is. What it, yes. you can, don't test me. You can test me no. if you want, but <laughs> you can test me all you want. Yes. But yeah. So what is what is seven four one? What am I doing with yes. that number? So thank you. Seven four one seven four one is what anyone can text. They can text hello. They can text help. You can text ayuda, hola in Spanish, right? Because Crisis Text Line is a service for English and Spanish speakers. And it's a bilingual, bicultural service. So it's not, you know, Google Translate. There are bilingual volunteers and bilingual mental health professionals to support our Spanish service. But I always recommend that everyone pause, take out their phone, save 741741 into their phone at a time when they are not in crisis so that when that moment comes, if that moment comes for you or for someone you know, you don't have to scramble to say like, what was that place that was 24 seven that could have helped me? You have it in your phone, text, someone is there immediately. 24 seven. 24-7. 24-7. Yeah, awesome. That's great. Free, so, free. Very important. Okay, 24-7 free, and free. free. 24-7 free, bilingual. Got yes. it. Yes. Put it in Spanish. your phone. Put so for our Black youth, let's talk about our Black youth um, before we start to wrap up in a bit. But so for our Black youth, um, our Black folks who are calling in or BIPOC folks who are texting, I should put it that way. Yes. What are some What are some things that we could be thinking about? Yes, we want them to have the number so they have some place 24-7 to be able to text and get support. What are some things, though, do you think that we should be thinking about to support our youth of color in particular and their mental health. So it's maybe some preventative things. I I don't, I don't want to get into the whole prevention world, but you know what I'm right. I mean, we see crisis text line as prevention. So insofar as you can text in before you are in that, you know, red zone stage four crisis, if it's, about a relationship, if it's, you know, you're sort of leading up to crisis, you need some help along the way to keep it from becoming such a major situation. Mm. Crisis text line is that type of prevention for, you know, for our BIPOC youth. And to know that like, nobody knows whether you're BIPOC or otherwise, unless you choose to tell them at some point, but you know, our crisis counselors are trained to be culturally competent and curious and open to uh, to working with, you know, textures of all demographics. So we really want them to know that Crisis Text Line is a resource, that we actually have a, a mental health school supply toolkit that's available for parents, teachers, administrators, college student specific and high school student specific with basically a crisis plan, all these things that can be downloaded and accessed by students themselves or people who take care of students that help with 
how to have conversations about your mental health, how to ask your child about mental health, breathing, you know, videos, just all sorts of tools to help in a crisis situation. What I love particularly is the mental health crisis plan, because that's something you can sit down with and generate, you know, when you're in a good space and pull out when you're in crisis. So you know that this is the person I'm going to call. This is the plan for me, right? I don't have to think about it because oftentimes those moments of crisis, we're dissociating, right? We're out of body. We're not thinking clearly, but if we can just follow the recipe here that I, you know, that you created for yourself, let me try these things in order to get to a cooler place. That's so important. I think also for our black youth to start to have the conversations with their parents and parents start to reach out to your children, recognizing that post pandemic, our children, our youth, our teens are fragile. There's a lot going on. And if they tell you something is wrong or that they want to hurt themselves, take that seriously. That is not something that we can sort of play around with or assume they're joking. Recent data research out there is showing how um, students are more apt to reach out to teachers and administrators more than parents sometimes, because it mm-hmm. sometimes the parents are really enmeshed in the whole situation at home. And teachers, uh, a trusted teacher can be a valued resource, but we've got to give the teachers the resources as well. Right. Um, but the bottom line is to just know that you're not alone, right? And because that's when people feel the most isolated and despondent and apt to, to harm themselves if they feel like they're not important to anyone or that they're by themselves and no one understands. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. And I think, I don't know if you um, also in the toolkit or have information to help both parents and teachers be able to ask people if they're going to harm yes. themselves because of that yes. fear. If I ask, I'm planting yes. it and then they're going to go do it, which we know is right. not the case, right? Is not true, is yeah. not true. And even knowing that, what we like to say and and what we like to help with those conversations in the toolkit speak to how do you sort of introduce that into the conversation, right? By saying, I see you, right? I see that you're not acting like yourself or you mentioned you felt hopeless. Let me ask you if you're feeling like you want to hurt yourself or are you having thoughts of death and dying, right? Mm -hmm. The more you can even practice that and get comfortable asking because it's it's far easier to be on the other side of that question and say yes thank you for asking yeah thank god you asked right as opposed to be you know sitting there and trying to figure out how do i introduce into yes. this conversation where we're sitting here at dinner that i'm thinking of hurting myself that i want to die right like that's such a shocking can feel like such a shocking statement yeah yeah yeah, I, you know, think back to to my times when, you know, this was a struggle for me. And and sometimes I would end up, you know, taking myself to the ER that that would end up that I would know how to do that and I would do that. But then once I got there, I didn't have the quote unquote guts to say what was going on. Right. Um, right. And I was trying to, and I keep and I kept saying to myself, can't they hear me screaming? But I wasn't, I was screaming in my head about the pain that I was experiencing and yes. I wanted that pain to end. I didn't have a vocabulary of a way to say it outside of my mouth. So right. I would try to, you know, do, you know, show all sorts of things. I don't, you know, again, I'm not supposed to be graphic, so I will not. And, and you know, totally miss. They would just totally miss it. But of course they would yeah. miss it. It's not there to be right. seen in that way, right? right. And I think, um, you know, back when I was much younger, when we're talking about young people, you know, eight or nine years old and struggling, um, you don't have the language for that pain. I, right. I, I think maybe kids nowadays probably are better equipped back in when I was younger and it wasn't the dark ages and there were not carriages and horses and stuff. It was right. not, I'm not that old, but um, no. you know, we didn't have the language and um, yes. I didn't want to scare my parents. That was the yes. biggest thing. I did not want to scare my parents. I didn't want them 
to be disappointed in me. I didn't want them to stop loving me. And you're already right. feeling very vulnerable and maybe like you're not lovable. And then you're going right. to say something like this and then it's kind of like going to blow up. So right. I think, you know, the more that this can be a normalized conversation, just like you yes. would have a conversation about breaking up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, you know, struggling with your homework, struggling with like getting up in the morning and seeing the purpose of life. Right. We've, we've only progressed incrementally since, you know, since you were younger, because I think children still feel that same sense of not wanting to disappoint or shock their parents, Mm -hmm. which is why I really feel it behooves us as adults to get our comfort level, uh, to adjust our comfort level to meet them so that we are the ones who struggle through the difficult conversation, but get to that child. I, I always feel like if you've asked the question about mental health, death and dying to the point where they're like, oh my God, not again, then you've normalized it, (laughs) right? You Mm -hmm. can bring it up over the dinner table. You can bring it up when you see something on TV, you've proven to your child that you are resilient enough to hear when those moments arise and that you want to hear when those moments arise so that they can come to you and say like, that's, I'm feeling it today. Right. Yeah. Don't, you know, and you both will know what that means today is not a good day. And I feel like hurting myself and they know what your response is going to be going to be because they've asked you to share that they've asked right. the child to share that right. with them. And again, if you're not in a safe place with family or others, that there right. are people where it is safe such as 741741. Right. 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 So right. Uh, in the in uh, Scotland, they had a, a mental health stigma campaign that was uh, uh, that you would see the button. It would say one dot dot four, four dot dot four, which means one in four f- are impacted by a mental health condition. Four people out of four can help. And I thought, oh, yes. my God, that is like the bomb that serious. We all yeah. have the ability to help. That's my little wisdom dropping. What is your wisdom dropping as we, I call it wisdom dropping. That's where you're going to drop one piece of final wisdom. You've been dropping wisdom throughout the whole conversation, but is there one piece of final wisdom that you would like to drop and leave with our listeners before we close out? Yes. So thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you for having me. Uh, The piece of wisdom that, that I'd love to share is really similar to yours, but recognizing that we are in a youth mental health crisis. We can't say that enough and that we all have a responsibility no matter no matter what we do, no matter what our career choice may or may not be to look out for our children because they're our future and they can't control the environment that's around them. They can only live in it. And if we can be that bridge for whatever mental health services and support they may need, let's do it. We have to be that. We have to be that, that adult for them. We have to be that adult. And even if it just means sharing 741, 741 with a, with a child or a teenager that, you know, and making sure you sit there with them while they put it into their phone. Thank you very much, Dr. Shairi Turner. Thank you so much. This This has been amazing. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate. I know you're very, 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 very busy, especially during this time. So thank you for giving of your time to have this conversation and unapologetically black unicorns. And uh, for our listeners, y'all know what to do. And you know what to do. Subscribe, comment. Yes, please. Share, please, please, please. And uh, you'll hear us next week on Unapologetically Black Unicorns. Thanks so much.